naked Be invited into places like Tel Aviv Great software Seriously, that's all you got? Yeah Are <laughs> you ready? Do we want to get into that? You can use DNA Boy, those robots are cool performance I'm also known on the internet as Johnny underscore Rugger. Uh, the Rugger is because I used to play rugby, which I'm kind of known for a little bit. Um, I also host the Elixir Fountain podcast. It's a weekly show uh, where we discuss not only Elixir, but things from around the, the Beam community. Uh, we also dive into some topics, just general software development topics. Uh, you can check it out. Uh, it's on SoundCloud. It's also on Twitter, Elixir Fountain. Um, but today I want to talk to you about something that I find truly interesting, genetics. Now there's a disclaimer to this talk, I'm not really a geneticist and I don't even play one on TV. Um, yeah, but I do know about spawning child processes. These are all mine. Um, now, so I, I don't know if it's like common over here, but we have, my wife and I have what's known as yours, mine, and ours. So. Can you spot which ones are actually mine and which ones are my stepkids? Um, so let's see here. Where's the light? There. Stepkid, stepkid, everybody else. So um, now this is my stepson, Ricky. And uh, it's, it's kind of funny when we talk about genetics and he goes, you know, do you think he looks like me? So uh, he goes to college right now. He's at Florida State University in Tallahassee, Florida. And um, he, we were out there for a football game, American football, of course. And <clears throat> we're sitting there, and some of his friends come up, and one of his you know, female friends or girlfriends walks up, and she's like, oh, you two look so much alike. We just kind of looked at each other and laughed. We're like, OK, no, no. Yeah, sure. But I mean, the thing is, is we both have blue eyes. You know, I've been around him since he was eight years old. And so, yeah, seven, eight years old. And so, you know, of course, mannerisms are a thing too. You know, the longer you're around somebody, you start kind of having the same postures and stuff like that. So it's not just a genetic thing. It's also just kind of just being around each other. But there's also a bit of a darker side to genetics. See, Ricky's a type one diabetic. Is anybody familiar with type one diabetes? Okay, it's actually a genetic thing. It's passed down from generation to generation, but sometimes it sticks, skips a generation. Um, my wife's father has type one diabetes and we didn't think anything of it. And this was right before fourth grade. It was the summer before fourth grade. And we had been doing a lot of things, going out, you know, taking all the kids everywhere and doing all this stuff. And um, anyway, we started noticing some odd behavior where he was actually like, you know, going to the bathroom a lot, you know, which is, a kind of a common sign that something's wrong, uh, especially for a kid, because usually they want to try to not go to the bathroom, <laughs> which that brings me to my six-year-old. No, but, you know, so we're like, well, maybe we should get him tested. He's drinking a lot of sodas. Of course, you know, his kids drink sodas and Gatorades and things like that. So we go to get him tested, and we don't think anything of it. School goes to start. My wife at the time was actually a teacher. Um, she's a, now still a teacher, but she's a homeschool teacher because um, we homeschool too because we're that crazy people. Um, but yeah, so she goes in the first day of class. Well, she gets a message from the doctor's office. Can you bring Ricky in? And so she calls the doctor's office and is like, you know, yeah, that's cool. It's the first day of school. There's a lot going on, of course. Can we come in maybe Friday? No, but when we say, can you bring him in, we mean like bring him in now and can you bring him to the emergency room? His blood sugar was over 500. And so they were basically, he spent the first four days of fourth grade in the hospital uh, and he has been insulin, uh, insulin dependent ever since. Now, my son, AJ, this is the six year old that we referenced earlier. Um, you know, my wife is very concerned. So now, of course, because she knows it's genetic, she knows it's something that's passed on, we watch everything the kids do. And it's kind of funny. And periodically, she even checks their blood sugar. <laughs> Which I feel bad. The poor kids use because they don't do it when they're awake, you know, because he will, he's not going to get stuck with a needle while he's awake. So you have to wait till he's asleep. And I'm thinking, oh, why would you do that? But I understand her, you know, concerns fear. Because the other thing is, is, could you imagine having to give this poor little guy an insulin shot every time he eats? It doesn't sound fun. So, 
There. So what are we going to talk about today? I know I'm just going to stay up here and ramble, or ramble for a while. But really what we're going to talk about is we're going to cover some simple genetics. See, we need a basic understanding of genetics to be able to implement what we want to implement. Um, how many are familiar with genetics? Oh, good. Okay, cool. So simple will be good. Um, but, you know, once we know the basics, we're actually going to build some stuff, which is really cool because everybody likes to see code, right? Really? We're at a conference. Everybody likes to see code, right? How many of y'all are familiar with Elixir? How many are familiar with Erlang? How many are familiar with OTP? Okay. Well, I can tell you right now that this is not an intro to Elixir. I'm going to be discussing some kind of deep things, and I'm not going to necessarily gloss over them, but I'm going to just say, don't worry about what it is. Just understand what I'm doing, and I'll point it out, uh, the important bits at least. And if you want to know more, definitely getting into something like Elixir in Action or something like that to find out more about OTP is the way to go. Or if you want to do something right now, you're so excited about it, come to the workshop this afternoon by Aaron Cruz. And I actually, I'm going to try to attend with him so that I can also help out with the Elixir section, which would be great. So let's get started. Genetics are discovered. So how many people are familiar with Gregor Mendel? Of course, you guys know genetics, so you've got to know Gregor, right? Well, he, for those of you that don't, he was a monk that was in St. Thomas Abbey. Uh, and he studied pea plants back in 1856 to 1863. Well, why pea plants? Do we know why pea plants? Who's got an answer for me? Short cycle. Short cycle. They're what's known as a model organism. Now, there's other model organisms that you probably have heard about. Rats in laboratories. Uh, fungus, fungi, um, fruit flies. Anything that has a nice short lifespan that you can easily kind of track and it's easy to contain them in a small area. You can imagine it's pretty easy to do uh, with pea plants. They don't travel very fast. <clears throat> so at the time, it was, uh, it was commonly thought of that traits were actually passed down through blended inheritance. Now, we can kind of disprove that pretty easily when we look at a set. So if blended inheritance was the thing, what that would mean is that the, uh, the genes that are passed on are actually an average of the two parents. So if we take this example right here where we have males and females with all their, uh, their heights, of say four and six, six and six, and five and three, well, what happens with the next generation? Well, then we have five and five, six and six, and four and four. Well, as you can see over time, if we were an all average, well, how many years have we been around? We'd all be about the same height and look about the same. So obviously that had to have been, uh, needed to be disproved. Now, what he actually studied were plant phenotypes. Now, these are the visible traits of an organism. Uh, he actually studied the main things were uh, shape, color, height, things like that. And he noticed that there was always like dominant and recessive traits that were showing up. Now, the way we look at this today is with the Punnett square. How many have seen a Punnett square before? Nice. So what a Punnett square does is actually takes the paternal and maternal um, genes, and we can actually see which ones are the, uh, uh, what's the probability of certain characteristics appearing. Now, what we have is homozygote and heterozygote. Now, the homozygote, the alleles are the same. So you have two dominant traits or two recessive traits. The uh, heterozygote is where you have a mix, a dominant and a recessive. Now, if we take it and look at this, we can see that 50% of the time, we're going to have Green, uh, green plants, and well, actually 75% of the time, because anytime you have dominant and then you have dominant and recessive, you're going to have green showing up. And only 25% of the offspring would actually be yellow plants. Now, think about like blue-eyed traits. Uh, blue-eyed, uh, you know, so going back to the kids, we all have blue eyes. Now, my wife has blue eyes, I have blue eyes. If one of us had brown eyes, there could be a possibility that we have blue-eyed children, but chances are if she passes the brown eye gene over, then that's it. The or, or blue eyes is a recessive trait. So we can also look at multiple traits with a Punnett square. Here we take uh, color and height, and we can actually see the probabilities of these where we have, oh, I'm not going to do quick math on there, but you get the gist of it. Now, what came out of mental studies? We have the three laws of inheritance. The first one being the law of segregation. Uh, 
Now, the law, law of segregation states that gametes form uh, when the gene splits, uh, and it's not based, oh wait, yeah, only one allele is passed off to the offspring. Sorry, kind of confused myself for a second. Now, the law of independent assortment says the dividing of those genes is independent, um, meaning that one, if one gene is passed, that not necessarily the other gene is passed. Uh, has no, there's no relevance to how the genes are actually passed over. Now, the law of dominance says that if a dominant trait is passed over, that will actually be the phenotype that shows up in the new organism. Now, the funny thing about Mendel's experiments is they went largely undiscovered for about 30 years. So he kind of did all this and everything was great and everybody learned all this stuff. Well, he did, but nobody else learned it until about 30 years later. Now, this reminds me of another story. If anybody that's familiar with Erlang, it went largely undiscovered for about 30 years. <clears throat> and then Jose discovered it. No. <laughs> um, so let's build things. Because this is what everybody really came to see, right? Let's look at, our, let's look at the system that we want to build. I hope everybody can see that. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to start with the Petri dish so that we have a place to actually store the organisms. Um, that is going to be a supervisor. That is actually going to supervise our organisms. Our organisms are also supervisors because when you think about it, your body has to actually manage all the processes. So we're going to have a biological clock that runs that kind of controls things like death, reproduction, that sort of thing. And we need a store to store our DNA because we're going to have to be able to take from the DNA and split our genes and things like that. This will be a gene server, this will be an agent, but we also have events. So we have our death handler and we have our reproduction handler. These are actually going to send notifications out to the system to say, hey, I need to do this thing, whether or not it's reproduce or, or, de or die, because everything has to die sometime, right? <coughs> and then we're going to actually have these other couple things where we have our reproduction gen server, which is going to handle the reproduction process, and we have our gene pool. We're thinking about these as kind of like pea plants. And so the idea is that they kind of throw pollen out in the air, and so you're going to actually throw the genes out into the air. When it finds the best match is when it's going to actually try to match up. <clears throat> so the first thing that we have to do is spawn an organism. Now, of course, the only thing that is true is death and taxes, and so the very first thing that we're going to do is kill it. Here's our Petri dish. Now, the important bits of this I highlighted where we're actually adding the organism to it, and we're adding it as a supervisor. Now, if you notice that we restart transient, we don't want zombie organisms, right? When they die, they die. We don't want them to restart. And we use a simple one-for-one -one strategy. Now, when you do this, you can only have one child process that you're watching. So we're going to actually have the organism start up, and the organism's actually going to control its own life events, as it should. <coughs> Now, here is our organism. Now, I'm going to break this down a little bit, but this is kind of a full view of it. As you see, when the organism starts, uh, we actually are going to start the biological clock, which is our first step we need to do, because as we know, once you're born, it starts ticking. We're going to actually use a struct, which is a way for us to kind of map the, some of the properties of an organism. If you see up there, we have our name and our PID so that we know what the process ID is, but we're also going to name these. I'm going to give a little disclosure right now. I do a horrible job of naming these. I automatically generate atoms just because it's easy to kind of see them, but you can use PIDs. There's other things you can use like GPROC and things like that if you're diving in where you actually want to still use names, uh, but you end up using a tuple to describe them. And our start we're going to actually, when we actually start the organism, what we're going to do is we're going to create the organism by passing it the gametes that it got. Now, this is our start child process. Here is our create organism. This is what actually happens when an organism comes to life. Now, we use the pipe operator. For those of you that aren't familiar with it, it's this handy little thing here. And we can actually pipe the results of the first, uh, the results of something to the first argument of the next function. So we can actually take our gametes, we can pass that to define organisms. The result of organisms gets passed to name organism, combined sizes, and you can see these other functions listed. Some of them will kind of go over right here. So in our define organism, the first thing that we do is we give it a name, and we also give it the birth time so that we know what time uh, it was born. Uh, but we also can kind of figure out when it's going to die based on that. Uh, the other thing is, is that we name the organism. Now, the naming is the process that I told you. I kind of 
abstracted that out a little bit, but basically it uses the birth date, uh, the birth date and time, and then it generates an atom for that. Love best practices, don't you? Um, <coughs> and then we actually combine our colors together to give us our DNA, because keep in mind we've been passed in two gametes, we need to merge them together to have our DNA. Now, here's our biological clock. And as we all know, like I said, as soon as this biological clock starts, we start figuring out when we're going to die. Because what better thing to do is to know exactly when you're going to die. <coughs> now this, uh, we're actually going to use the process send after. So we're going to give it a set amount of time that's a random time uh, so that different organisms will die differently or different times. And then here we're actually going to do, this is our death call. So this is what happens. We're going to actually raise the event death uh, so that we have our event handler that's listening for this. As soon as it is, it's been given the organism. It knows which one to kill, and it sends a message to the Petri dish to kill it. Here's our actual handler where we send the uh, death event. And if you see our kill organism, there's a P there. Um, and in our Petri dish, we actually have our kill uh, organism, which all it really does is terminate the child, so that basically it kills it off from the, the Petri dish. And there you have it. We actually have an organism that can bo be born as a process, live for a set amount of time, and then die, and it, it can have its uh, traits. But now we need to actually store that DNA. Now, to store the DNA, we're going to use an abstraction around GenServer called Agent. Uh, the agent won't only store the, DNA, uh, the particular genes, but it's also going to be responsible for sharing those genes when it, when it comes time to reproduce. Here's our agent code. Now, agents are actually started with a quick start link. Uh, we pass in some sort of data. We don't have to, and we give it a name so that we know which uh, agent we're calling into because we want to make sure you're calling in the right agent. Uh, we have this function called gamete which when given the organism, it'll actually retrieve the gametes for a particular organism. Uh, you can see we use this notation right here, the shorthand, to where we say retrieve gamete. Uh, we pass it the results, and then clicker down here. There. And here's our retrieve gamete. Now remember, we also talked about the law of segregation and the law of independent assortment. So each of these genes has to be split separately. Each of these traits has to be split separately. And it has to be random. So if you notice down here, where we're actually passing in the phenotype, this join pairs and, oh, did it not make it on the slide? Didn't make it on the slide. Um, but we also have split them independently, randomly. So we only take one or the other. We don't necessarily take both. So now reproduction. Uh, we're going to add the reproduction event uh, so that we can actually reproduce these. Now this is actually going to be a gen server again. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to have the biological clock determine the, the rate of reproduction based on traits. So we use some pattern matching up here. Uh, we actually match on the speed trait. And if it's a fast reproducing organism, it's going to set the uh, there, I'm losing my clicker. It's going to have the actual shortest reproduction span. Uh, the slowest is going to have a slow, and then there's a one that, if it's a mix, it's going to actually just kind of be in the middle average. Now, as you can imagine, if you randomly die, there's a very good possibility that if you're a slow reproducing organism and you're a quick death, you're probably not going to be able to contribute to the gene pool. To reproduce, we actually just raise the event for reproduction. Uh, when we do that, we pass it the organism. The organism actually calls back into that DNA in that gametes function, and it's going to actually split the pairs and give us a set of DNA to actually pass over into the gene pool. Now, we're going to add our gene pool uh, event handler, and then basically we have an organism that can actually reproduce. Now, the problem is, is we don't have a gene pool to actually reproduce in or any type of spawn handlers to notify the Petri dish that a new organism has, uh, has arrived. So we're going to create a gene pool. Now our gene pool we're also going to use an agent for. Uh, basically we're going to pass in. Now the big thing to note about this is we're using a fitness. Uh, if you're familiar with the, the concept of a fitness, like this is the ideal organism. It is going to be a green, fast producing, tall organism. So when, those, when the data comes in, we actually do um, we try to take action on that match. So we want to try to find the optimal match. Uh, so if it matches a particular set of gene traits, 
Uh, we want to actually spawn that organism. We want to raise that event and say, hey, I've got a good match. If not, we just stay in the gene pool. So everybody gets a chance to contribute, but it might take a while for you to get around. And here's our event handler once again, uh, to where, well, a different event handler, but it's our spawn where we're actually going to notify the Petri dish to create a new organism. Go ahead and add our handler. And then we go ahead and add our function to actually add that new, um, add that new child to, the, to our supervisor. Now, as you see, we pass in the gametes. It knows to go ahead and add those, create the new organism, and load it up. Now, I'm sure what you're all saying right now is, this, does this work? Well, what we'll do is we'll start with uh, just two organisms. Um, and actually, we'll go through and we'll see how it seeds. And let's see here. Go here. Now, a couple of things I want to show you. I'm going I'm to kick this off one time. And so the first time I'm going to kick it off, we'll see it kind of go for a second. But there's a couple tools that I want to show you. Um, so here we go. Oh, oh, that's right. I needed to change that. I put four organisms in there. But this is Observer. Now, an Observer, we can actually see our processes. As you can see, they're actually multiplying pretty quick now. Uh, and I probably actually, let's do this a little faster. We're actually moving, it's probably moving too fast to actually, there. You can see them dying. If you watch this number, <laughs> you can see them actually die over time. Now, granted, it's a random time, so uh, let's see. Now, the other way, which is actually a little cooler to look at them, is by doing this. Uh, Overgraph. And you can actually move these around. We can find them there. There's a cluster of them. I can zoom in. And you can kind of see all your processes. As you can imagine, with names like this, it's really fun to try to track them. <laughs> hey, there's Ted. No, just uh, um. <coughs> so. Kill the right thing. And as you can see over time, too, as you watch these, now, now keep in mind I'm using Adam, so eventually I'll run out of memory and it'll kind of crash it, so it's kind of fun. Um, <coughs> but if you watch the traits, like, Pretty much most of the organisms that are being reproduced are fast reproducing organisms. Uh, seems to make sense, right? You've got a bunch of organisms where it's optimal to be fast, and so they're all being fast. The other thing that you note is the number of green organisms. Oh, there it goes. It's dead. But <coughs> it's like global annihilation in the Petri dish, right? Um, but if you know, now we can actually kind of see the, some of the traits that have come up. We do have a couple of yellow organisms, but not very many. We definitely have a larger population of green organisms. And you can, the nice thing about modeling things like this is you can actually make adjustments to, to the fitness. You can change fitness. You can also have more characteristics. So say you were trying to do something with um, uh, testing models, and you are working with neural networks, things like that, where you're actually wanting to have multiple types of organisms that you're actually testing how they respond to things. You can send messages to them. They can die off. They can restart. You can manage your processes. I know one of the things that I'm currently working on in the company I'm working is, is asset management for uh, renewable resources. There's all sorts of problems that happen with electrical grids with uh, renewable resources. And the idea is you want to be able to test the assets that are on that network. Well, you don't necessarily want to test that in production because if you do, then you have failures and you have all sorts of problems. But so you can set up these models where you actually run scenarios and let them learn and learn how to recuperate from different events that are happen on the system. OTP works great for this. Uh, let's see. Uh, I totally killed that. Now, as you saw, we actually did go ahead and add four more, or two more organisms to it. And so now we had more organisms. Now, what does that bring us to? What's the point of all this? So 
the thing is, is I really didn't do anything new here. I mean, this stuff has all been around. OTP has been around since the 90s. Erlang's been around since the third, or the for 30 years since yeah, since the 30s. Um, <coughs> they just didn't know about it yet. Um, no, but. And the same thing with Gregor, Gregor Mendel, like he only observed something that was actually happening and then made note of it. He didn't actually do anything other than study it. <clears throat> now, OTP I leveraged, uh, Erlang I leveraged, but I built this with Elixir. So the thing is, is though, is nobody really knew that was happening because it went undiscovered for 30 years. Now, when you look at the story of Elixir and kind of the emergence, yeah, people had heard about Erlang. They probably thought about it. They, they, so many people used it, but on a very small scale. So the, the story of the rise of Elixir kind of reminds me of a little story about discovering genetics. Anybody familiar with these three? Huh? You know Joe. Everybody knows Joe. These are the three creators of Erlang. So I love to show this slide because they all have that kind of look on their face like, yeah, we were doing that forever. What are you talking about? Now, one of the things that I started with uh, when I got into Elixir, I've been into Elixir for about three and a half years now. And one of the things that I noted is we were very much a distributed team. Five minutes? Okay. Um, we were very much of a distributed team. We had people all over the world in small, very small sometimes pockets working on Elixir. And there was not really a good way uh, to share what was going on because nobody really knew who was working on what. So what I did was I actually started a hashtag called my Elixir status. And if you've probably looked into Elixir at all, you've probably seen this hashtag. But it's been a great way for us to communicate who's working on what and what's going on. Uh, it's actually, if you go on and check the my Elixir status, and I actually do hand retweet all the retweets, um, just because I like to try to make sure when I'm retweeting sometimes. Um, <coughs> But you can actually learn a lot about Elixir. You can see what people are working on. You can see their blog posts. You can see their projects they're working on. A lot of times people even pose questions on there uh, so that they can actually communicate with people that they're not, maybe not familiar with. So the thing about Elixir, and the one thing that I really love and I like to convey is the, 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 the passion for discovery with Elixir. Like it's, the, the community as a whole is very much about getting the answer right and to questioning those answers. So it's a constantly revisiting. Are we doing things right? Are we working on the right models? Are we doing the right thing as we're working in development? And a lot of times the question is, I don't know, but let's work on it. And that's a great part, uh, part of being uh, a great part of being in this community. For those of you that are interested in genetics, I got some more links for you. Uh, if you don't have anything to do this afternoon or for a week, check out Swimbots. Actually, Paolo was the one that showed me Swimbots a couple of years ago. Um, it's written in Java, but we won't hold that against it. Um, <clears throat> but it's basically a way to have a Petri dish, and you can visualize all these creatures that are in there, and you can make adjustments to the fitness for these creatures. Uh, it's a great tool. It's fun, and it also, you know, kill an afternoon. The other one is Boxcar 2D, where it generates cars randomly to try to find the optimal, uh, optimal car to get the furthest distance. The other thing is, is the Science Museum, there's actually an app, and uh, I need to... I need to add this to the site. I'll make sure I tweet about it if anybody's following me on Twitter. But there's an app from the, the London Mu or Science Museum uh, where they actually have races and you can log into theirs and you can actually race against people that are racing in the museum and you can generate your own car. It gives you like an engine and you draw what you think might be the optimal car and put wheels on it and things like that. And so then you do test runs. My six-year-old and I have gotten really good at it. I, have, I think I pretty much got the optimal car. So, there you have it. And I don't think I have any time for questions, but thank you for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. And